Okay people, welcome back. This is the third chapter of Ireland, Land of the Pharaohs. And before I go into the chapter, the chapter is called Brew in the Boyne. I just want you to have a look, little look at this place. Um, Brew in the Boyne, Palace of the Boyne or Mansion of the Boyne or Boyne Valley Tombs is an area in County Meath, Ireland located in a bend of the river Boyne. It contains one of the world's most important prehistoric landscapes dating from the Neolithic period, including the large megalithic period passage graves known as Nowth, Newgrange and Douth, as well as some 90 additional monuments. The archaeological culture associated with the, these sites is called the Boyne culture. Since 1993, the site has been a World Heritage Site designated by UNESCO known since 2013 as the Bruna Boyne, Archaeological Assembly of the Bend of the Boyne. So, quite an important site. Without further ado people, welcome back and I hope you're enjoying this book. I, I, I find it really interesting, it links a lot of my um, theories together. I'm not saying it's got a line totally. And what's interesting about these books that I've came across, like Commons, Beaumont, and uh, this one here, and several others in the past, that I never got to my conclusions by reading these books. I never, these books never put me on my journey. I was already on a journey, and I got pushed these books forward towards me. Um, I've got to say the first, the earliest person I heard, probably with these kind of theories, is Tazarian. But the reason why I, I went into these theories myself, I was, I was trying to find out the whole Israel thing with Britain. Why did Britain create Israel? Why is this war going on in Israel right now? Um, and th that's what led me to these tribes. Um, anyway, without further ado, people, thanks for joining me. And I hope you're having a good week so far. Okay, Chapter 3, Bru Naboin. Nothing could be more profitable to us than a right history of mankind. So that was a, a statement by the famous, the, the infamous Adam Weishaupt, who created the so-called Illuminati. Anyway, the thrill of seeing the awe-inspiring Bruna Boy megaliths for the first time, where the first survivors left after the global catastrophe to repopulate the world, still lingers in my memory. It was in the late summer of 1985, in those days before the impressive visitor centre was opened, it was still possible to navigate the narrow leafy lanes to go directly to the passage tombs, a misnomer of the first degree. Today the official tourist route is by shuttle bus via the visitor centre. Approaching Newgrange, at first time there was not the slightest inkling this was to become the beginning of an incredible adventure which would be in the fullness of time lead to the discovery of the cradle of civilization. Moreover, if you, dear reader, will reserve judgment, you might experience the tingle of rev revelation that is felt when ingrained myths are re-examined and replaced by refreshingly different perceptions of reality. Myths, like any story, can be true or false. They are usually a mixture of both. William Henry, in his book, The Language of the Birds, Describing myths, writes, Metaphors have multiple levels of meaning that are perceived simultaneously. Their meanings transcend or cross over time and cultures. Studying their accumulated meanings takes us to the original event or object symbolised by the metaphor. We can begin to identify the true subject of a myth or metaphor by paying close attention to the subtle inter interconnectedness of the definitions of the myriad of proper names and place names contained within them in English. The discovery of the city of Troy, credited to the controversial German archaeologist Heinrich Schleiman in 1870, his discoveries were based on the work of an English archaeologist, Frank Calvert, demonstrates how myth and reality can be two sides of the same coin. Until Schleiman's discovery, the the story of the city of Troy had been regarded solely as myth. Other famous myths also produced fabulous discoveries. It was believed that the legend of the buried cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum 
were myths. They were spoken as, of, as fabulous cities. For a thousand years, the educated world did not credit the accounts given by Herodotus of the wonders of the ancient civilizations of the Nile and of Chaldea. He was called the father of lies. Even Plutarch sneered at him. To understand that myths are not always just fantasy will be a useful asset in the process of freeing our minds. For our purpose, let's define myths as the heart of the story and empirical facts as the head. That is to say, the facts tell us that something took place and when, with all its details, myth, in contrast, reveals the inner purpose or the hidden subtext. My continuing anecdote about New Greece demonstrates yet another synchronicity since the only reason we were here at all was because the incumbent Imperator Gary Stewart of the Rosicurian Order, Amarch Anticus Mysticiski Ordo Rosi Cruscus, was on a flying visit to Ireland from headquarters in San Jose, California, at the time of the World Sea of the Rosicurian Order. Along with other freighters and sorors, brothers and sisters, we accompanied him on a tour of various ancient sites which concluded at Newgrange. Up until then, the name Newgrange had held no significance for me whatsoever, and Bruna Boyne had not even appeared on my radar, so there wasn't any reason to suspect it would form the basis of an unorthodox story that would dare challenge what has been recorded as world history. Since my initiatory trip to Newgrange was in the company of Amark students, a cursory look at the history and structure of the Rosicurian order would be appropriate. Amark traces its traditional history to the early period of the 18th dynasty of Egypt and to the pharaoh Thutmose III, circa 1501 BCE. He was at the forefront when the earliest recorded organised mystery schools was founded, but it is not until Amenhotep VI Akhenaten comes to the fore that the public phase of the mission begins proper and Akhenaten receives the mantle of Grand Master. Akhenaten, through his daughter Scotta, was a patriarch of the original Scots-Irish tribes, of which see Chapter 4. The historian's recorded existence of the Rosicurians begins with the publication of a manifesto entitled The Fama Fraternitas in 1614. Although one can find veiled references to Rosicurians as far back as the 14th century. Edith Starr Miller writes, According to Charles T. McLennan, 33 degree historian, Grand Lodge, State of New York, this same legend had appeared in the work of the philosopher Raymond Lully, who died in 1315. There are reference to an early chronology within the higher teachings of Amark. The Rosicurian order is internationally acknowledged as an educational order with an esoteric curriculum based on the metaphysical study of being known as ontology, which explicitly means the study of everything. Primarily within it encompasses the study of man, microcosm, and his relationship and place within the universe, macrocosm. By following the command found above the temple of the oracle at Delphi in ancient Greece, man know thyself. Rosicurians encourage students not only to think for themselves, but to develop a philosophy of life based on an inner conviction that stems from contemplation and meditation, and thus leading to a master of life, the goal of each Rosicurian student. Each sincere Rosicurian student, by token, would be a walking question mark. It is the question that drives us, Trinity tells Neil in The Matrix. An old dictum states that one does not join the Rosicurians, they become a Rosicurian. It follows when that our group was well equipped to question the mundane theories of the magnificent Bruna Boyne monuments to try to unlock the ancient secrets. These few insights will hopefully demonstrate to the reader how much easier it was for me as an R plus C student and for a time a member of the Orange and Masonic Orders to recognise the more cryptic pieces of the puzzle and to integrate them into the unusual investigation we have engaged in. It was almost as if my experiences in my life were preparing me for the task ahead. Just to be in this mystical landscape encouraged the seeds of my theories to take root 
and sprout an amazing catalogue of so-called coincidences. Of course, we didn't know then that where we stood in front of the Newgrange Cairn overlooked an equally ancient landscape, the little-known Emin. This knowledge was to come later as the puzzle pieces started ever so slowly to slot into place, often with imp imperceptible ease and with almost no input from me. Nevertheless, it was one of my now regular jaunts to Newgrange that it dawned on me that all the crossing points of the battle between William and James were situated in the ancient heart of Bruna Boyne. In retrospect, this was the genesis of my theories, which led to questioning the traditional views about the Prince of Orange and the erstwhile British Stuart King James II, their ancient occult houses and their alleged battle at the mystical Boyne River. Sincere inquiries are always re rewarded. In this case, it was the unveiling of the keys that unlocked the portal that led to the Holy Grail, the hidden history of the Western world. At first, my sceptical mind questioned why someone from my background, someone with very little formal education, should be presented with such a task and privilege. However, when my mind finally accepted when everything was taken into account, it could have been no other way. Standing in front of the New Grange Cairn, lost in reverie, pondering on these thoughts, and as my eyes scanned the rolling hills of Emmain, a blinding insight rocked me and led me to the conclusion that there were more mysteries here than the traditional historians could or would ever uncover. During these ambiguous musings, one question stood out. Why would anyone want to keep knowledge about what happened in this place secret? There was no doubt in my mind the establishment wanted it to be this way, and they knew it would be easy because we hab habitually don't question what we are told by higher authorities. See chapter 2. More and more riddles surfaced, firstly one at a time, then like a swarm of bees buzzing in my head. It puzzled me why mainstream historians never make the connection between the internationally famous battle and even more famous monuments in this ancient landscape. To me it seemed so obvious, even with my lack of academic training. At that moment, a breeze stirred, and like a golden eagle gliding across the Emin, sent a shiver tingling down my spine, as it seemed to whisper, I do not give up my secrets easily. Perhaps it was the go goddess Boan, reassuring me that the same way Morpheus reassured Neo, when he said, relax, the answers are coming, and indeed they did. After this intuitive event, doubts intensified in my mind about historical and societal beliefs and about just how real this world was. Queries that my conscious mind was making left the bicameral aspect of it confounded. One of the more persistent questions that demanded an answer pushed forward rather mockingly. So what is the purpose? What is the supposed esoteric connection between this ancient land and the famous battle? My heart knew exactly what had happened in the Boyne Valley. It was a religious battle fought to maintain and protect our Protestant heritage. But now my head and the increasingly irrefutable evidence were showing me something that should have been anathema to me. It was not a battle, but something much more exhilarating. Frozen to the spot in what seemed a different reality, wrestling these alien thoughts, a sudden rush of energy assaulted my nervous system as the memories of my youth flooded back into my consciousness, leaving me light-headed. My throat tightened with emotion at the recollection of watching the colourful fife and drums band and swirling orange banners depicting William and his white charger go by. At that moment, two verses of the scripture came to mind that pointed my story again in the direction of mythology. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he sat that on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering, and to conquer. And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. It should be noted that in solar religions, upon which this ritual was based on, the white horse is sacred to the sun god. Once again that familiar, although unsought feeling of pride accompanying a pondering, Pounding heart was again evoked. Was this a result of an imperceptible race, memory of a long-forgotten golden age in our distant Scots, Irish, British 
Israeli history? The question snapped me back into reality before any answer could formulate. But my brain was now in overdrive and continued to speculate on those questions that had not concerned me since childhood were now rising anew with increasing vigour. Why was William only ever portrayed crossing the Boyne? Not with his sword pointing directly over his horse's head. This query, perhaps appearing inconsequential to the reader, would not let go. It captivated me that something extraordinary had happened in this mystic land and that this was an important clue. Increasingly, the evidence mounted, leaving me excited, shocked, angry and confused all at the same time. Through this babble surfaced additional clues that would finally compel me to fully accept a completely different view of reality. My initial enthusiasm fueled my ego as it tried hard to convince me that these unusual discoveries could make a difference in this unhappy world. But would they be accepted? Unlikely. But there was nothing else for it. My thoughts, like chattering monkeys, would not be quiet, qu quietened. quietened. The possibilities had to be examined. While these novel concepts about history were exciting, they still had to battle with some well-entrenched ideas and prejudices. New wine and old bottles comes to mind. Ideas like, that is the way things were. It could not have been any other way, and if you think differently, you are being ridiculous and letting your side down, which helps keep everyone on message. What a brilliantly manipulative way to stop any meaningful questioning of the status quo and prevent us from discovering our true heritage. Nevertheless, these powerful new paradigms could prove devastating to this outmoded mindset. Other dogmatic views that were prevalent within my community went along the lines of Irish, Celtic, history was a territory of the Irish Catholic and had nothing to do with us, the Ulster Protestant. This precluded the history of an important pro province positioned to the northeast of the island that was part of the old Red Branch Kingdom of O'Neill's Ulster. The Loyalist community in Ireland, if they thought about it much at all, most concluded that their traditional history as an established nation living in Ireland only went back to about the 17th century. This, of course, embraced the events of 1690 and, and all it stood for and taking into account the exploits of the Masonic Prince William. Our history tells us he de defeated King James in a religious battle at the Boyne River without giving any thought to the ancient land where it took place to save the British throne and by implication our contemporary Protestant society from the dark forces coming out of Rome. Paradoxically, we reinforced the widespread myth that our predecessors were planters mainly from Scotland who came to Ulster and disenfranchised, disenfranchised the native population. My own family, for example, came into Waterford, close to the southwest of Ireland, as early as the 12th century from France. Anyhow, my research was to show a confusingly different and much more cryptic story about the arcane relationship between all British Irish people and their ancient connection to this primordial island. The distinctiveness of much of this research arises because of my insights into how the orange Protestant psyche works. This proved important to put the more mythological and esoteric elements which are legion of the story together. Having access to the mystery school teachings was equally valuable, which goes some way to answering a previous question, why me? There were also many insights and much information passed on to me from other researchers and authors such as Peter Dawkins and Jordan Maxwell, who had added greatly to my understanding of the role of mythology in history. Who was it that said, we see further because we stand on the shoulders of giants? Peter's original theories include the discovery of how the ancient priesthood regarded the landscape as a temple and worshipped within it. He explains how they utilise the earth energies that flow through the temples for a holistic healing. Peter, a qualified architect, is an expert in sacred geometry and the founder of the Zoents Academy that teaches, amongst other things, and for want of a better explanation, a western form of Feng Shui. As Peter's concepts claimed their place in our picture puzzle, along came Jordan Maxwell. Jordan explained how ancient peoples who live within the temple landscapes, organise their lives according to the laws of nature they saw manifesting about them and cosmic laws they observed in the sky above them. This hints at the hermetic 
aphorism, as above, so below, as below, so above. In addition to these two exceptional researchers, there were a bevy of others queuing to contribute to my increasingly sense of wonder and about how our history has been so grossly distorted. Some of these authors we have already met and some we have yet to meet, people such as Steve Begstrom, Emmanuel Velikovsky, H. Spencer Lewis, L.A. Wallace, Commons Bowman, Graham Hancock, Robert Burwell, and others too numerous to list here. Their assistance, coupled with my diverse and unique background of study and experience of the secret orders and mystery schools, allowed me to begin unravelling this inimitable account of our lost inheritance. Within my tribe, an apt description of the people who resettled in the area of the British Isles known as Ulster, the established beliefs concerning the famous battle are quite simplistic. The illustrious Pro Protestant William of Orange arrived in England from Holland to overthrow Catholic King James in the so-called Glorious or Bloodless Revolution in the year 1688 CE. He continued on to Ireland, specifically to Bruna Boyne, where he crossed the Boyne River, thereby completing his mission. Not connecting the temple landscape with the battle, historians could never hope to find the lost keys that reveal a hidden history. The fully developed picture, however, will leave you in no doubt as to the esoteric aspects of a ritual battle that left codified messages stamped indelibly on the landscape of Bruna Boyne, and astonishingly, this was matched in the astral configurations, as above, so below. Moreover, the ritual illuminates aspect of a history that the two major branches of the Christian religion in Ireland could share, yet have distanced themselves from, through apathy and massive manipulation. The historic significance of Bruna Boyne and the ritual battle have been so cunningly divorced from each other that we naively accept the manipulative fables we have been spoon-fed over the centuries about history, when it is realised that two schools in Belfast, within a stone's throw of each other, literally, are taught diametrically opposed histories, it becomes clear how the manipulation is ex executed. The why, of course, another matter. Tragically, we have been cheated out of an inclusive heritage that would have been invaluable to us in the process of building true peace. Perhaps this would explain why two sides of a once singular race are out of harmony with their environment and their history. We could learn a great deal from our not-so-distant ancestors who definitely did know of their natural relationship to the cosmos, the earth and each other, attributes we have long lost, but with a little knowledge and a lot of effort can be recovered and implemented into our everyday lives to the benefit of everyone. It was increasingly evident that these so-called coincidences driving this story were leading me unerringly to the Boyne Valley to reveal the incredible events that happened there. An old axiom gives us an insight into what coincidences are. A coincidence is a miracle in which God wishes to remain anonymous. Returning to our jigsaw puzzle, we discern our picture is developing into a road map leading to a portal concealed within the Bruna Boyne. We will eventually pass through this portico where we will find ourselves in an amphitheatre-like landscape there to witness for the first time in modern history an incredible symbolic battle. We have concluded accepted history relegates this battle of the Boyne to no more than a skirmish in passing and that it is only in hindsight it was deemed of importance. Many conventional historians negate the significance of what occurred by ripping this phrase out of its proper context and in so doing distort history. When evidence as to the occult facets of the battle is offered and the symbolism deciphered, the world will discover the British Isles as the cradle of modern civilization. This ritual could not have taken place anywhere else in the world since it was a celebration of the fact that the Bruna Boyne was the birthplace of humanity. Previously, we discovered that another motivation was to establish an invisible portal to preserve our history from the grasp of the dark forces in the hope that someone, when the time was right, would decipher at least some of the clues they offered. Let me say now, that the book you have in your hands is the key to that portal, and it is no accident you are holding it. Believe it. There is no such thing as coincidence. There is only cosmic synchronicity. Outwardly, the House of Orange was representing the Reformation at the Battle, the New World Order. The Stuart House, 
however, being sponsored by Louis the 18th, the Bourbons of 14th, I'm not sure, upheld the state status quo and the divine right of kings to rule, that is, the old world order. Another view, the traditional accepted one, is that the battle would determine which branch of the Christian religion was to dominate Britain and Ireland into the following century. This, as we already have discovered, was far from the truth. Evidence that William and James knew the importance of their family line and why they were to participate in this upcoming ancient ritual is overwhelming. William, when he completed his mission, became nothing less than the Horace King. It is generally accepted in historical circles that William confirmed his kingship. In fact, he became a king at the Boyne. We will come to understand the, re the relevance of this statement, but from a radically different viewpoint than the traditionalist world would. Sorry. This extraordinary thesis about William and James participating in an Egyptian solar ritual will seem less bizarre when it is known that their families were of Egyptian descent. They both knew their ancestry went back much further. It will be proposed that they knew their genealogy predated Egypt and originated on the island where they now stood and where they would perform a ritual that was well known to the original inhabitants of this land. To qualify the preceding statements, it has to be said that the, pro the proposition of links between Egypt, Ireland and the enigmatic Stuart Orange houses as has been revealed in this book is not unique theory. A unique theory. In his book, The Sword and the Grail, for example, Andrew Sinclair compiles a speculative listing of the treasures of the Templars and shows how they connect the kings of Scotland with the House of Israel. All the marvels of the castles of the Fisher King were also to be found in the castle of the, of the Divine Lug, which held the treasures of the Celtic gods, including a bleeding lance. He also catalogues a bottomless drinking vessel, a cauldron that could feed an army, an unconquerable sword, a stone fallen from heaven, as in Parsifal, the stone of destiny or scone. He goes on to explain the significance of this artefact. This sacred stone was traditionally said to be Jacob's pillow or the stone of the covenant. It proved the descent of the kings of Scotland from the kings of Judah and Israel in the house of David. In Bethel, Jacob was held to have set up his pillow or pillar and to have anointed it with oil. God then made a covenant with him that his sons would always rule Israel as long as Israel recognised the Lord God. The stone pillow or pillar was a witness to this sacred bond. In legend, during the persecution of the Jews by Nebuchadnezzar, the holy prophet, Olam Fodal, or Jeremiah, brought Jacob's pillow to Tara, accompanied by Princess Tephi, the daughter of King Zedekiah of Judah. She married Ekudid the I, the Ardath, or High King of Ireland, and the Holy Stone of Judah became the coronation stone of the Inch High Kings, until Fergus Mor, the first King of Argyll, brought the sacred stone to Scotland, and to prove his anointed descent from the House of David by consecration, and coronation. Andrew records still older sources that show Fergus Mor Mac Erk was the king of the Scots and it was he that led his nation out of Ireland, near Scotland, to Alba or Caledonia. Later they adopted the name they used in their old homeland, Scutinland, which more briefly is called Scutland or Scotland. We will through necessity, return frequently to the chronology of the Scots-Irish, or as Spencer calls them, Scythians, but we know this is only one of the names they have been known by throughout their extensive history, to chart the progress as they make their mammoth effort to return home. Spencer is only one of many writers who claim the Scots-Irish were Scythes. He writes, Their fierce running upon their enemies and their manner of fight resembleth altogether that which is read in all histories to have been used of the Scythians. It may almost infallibly be gathered together with other circumstances that the Irish are very Scots or Scythes originally. Andrew Sinclair is, incidentally, a descendant of Sir William St. Clair of the famous Scottish St. Clair family who's, who was one of the Illuminati and founder of Roslyn Chapel in Scotland. Roslyn, which bears the name of the village where it is situated, 
although when referred to the village it is usually spelt Roslyn, as a Templar chapel whose foundations were laid in 1446. It has been a source of mystery and speculation ever since. According to Masonic historians Robert Lomas and Christopher Knight, the name Roslyn is derived from the Scottish Gaelic Ross, a noun meaning knowledge, and Lynn meaning generation. From this they conclude, it seemed that in Gaelic, Roslyn would translate as knowledge of the generations. Attempts to confirm this claim independently with the Gales Department at Queen's University of Belfast came to naught as they were unable to make the connection between Ross and Irish Gaelic, which means prom promonitory, to be fair Knight and Lomas address this anomaly, and the interpretation their source, Tessa Ransford, director of the Scottish Poetry Library in Edinburgh, put on it. After more research, Tessa and friends come up with this even more complete and no less intriguing interpretation, which was ancient knowledge passed down through the ages. The, re re the relevance of Roslyn to our story becomes obvious when we consider the links between the Stuarts and the St. Clairs. Tim Wallace, Murphy and Marlon Hopkins in their book Roslyn, Guardians of the Holy Grail, corroborate these, corroborate these links by showing that the St. Clairs were among a group of families linked by marriage, blood and shared loyalties and beliefs who were involved with the Templars throughout their history and with the propagation of their tradi tradition after the suppression with early Freemasonry in Scotland and with the support of the Stuart cause. Recent studies of the Rex Deus legend have suggested that the Stuarts were actually descendants from leading families among the hierarchy in biblical Israel at the times of Jesus and even the Stuart dynasty is still extant to this day. It is reasonable, therefore, to presume that these beliefs and the biblical dynastic roots were shared by these twelve families who were so committed to the, both the Templars and the Stuarts. According to Tim and Marlin, the twelve families were represented by eleven knights who left Scotland, led by Henry de St. Clair, to accompany Godfroy de Bouillon to the Holy Lands in 1096 CE, and were present at the latter, latter fall of Jerusalem in 1100. The Stuarts and their ancestry whose meaning and original name Stuart suggests they were guardians of something of great import, we find entangled with other major European royal houses that extend back to be, to be lost in the mists of time. To maintain a sense of balance, we will take a brief look at the genealogical roots of the other principal house involved in the ritual battle. The origins of the House of Orange are firmly established in southern France, and the Principality of Orange. It was gifted to Guillaume de Gelon, the first Prince of Orange and Count of Razès, in 803 CE with Charlemagne for Guillaume's services in his war against the Moors. According to Bagent, Lee and Lincoln, in their international bestseller The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, he was one of the most famous men of his time, so much so that his historical reality, like that of Charlemagne and Godfrey de Bouillon, has been obscured by legend. Before the epoch of the Crusades, there were at least six major epic poems composed about him. When Charlemagne's son, Louis, was invested as emperor, it was Gilliam who placed the crown on his head. Louis was reported to have said, Lord William, it is your lineage that has raised up mine. It is an extraordinary statement, given that it is addressed to a man whose lineage, as far as latter historians are concerned, would seem to be utterly obscure. Although he was one of Charlemagne's most entrusted generals, his family's history is shrouded in mystery. But according to a poem by the German Wolfram von Eschenbach, they were associated with the mysterious Grail family or Moravian Mar Maraving Mar Mar bloodline. Merovingian bloodline, sorry. Most revisionist histor historians who researched this era drag out the red heron of the Morovingians or long-haired kings as being the descendants of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. It does, however, give us a piece of the puzzle that connects the first Prince of Orange with the Holy Lands and House of Judah. At the apex of his power, Gilliam de Gilon included amongst, among his domains northeastern Spain, 
the Pyrenees in the region of southern France, known as Septimania. This area had long contained a large Jewish population. During the 6th and 7th centuries, this population enjoyed an extremely cordial relations with its Visigoth overlords, who exposed Aryan Christianity. So much so, in fact, that mixed marriages were common and the words Goth and Jew were often used interchangeably. The, re the research of Bajant, Lee and Lincoln shows that Gilliam's father, Theo Theodoric, or Theori, Theori, was king of the Jews of Septimania and that Gilliam was not only Merovingian but also a Jew of royal blood. It is no surprise that the Jews found a warm welcome in the Netherlands when the House of Orange came to power. Gilliam's nickname was Old Hook Nose, and as was that of William III, who also possessed a hooked or Roman eagle nose. The authors of the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail also draw heavily on the theory of a div divine bloodline. By inference then, if we accept the line of reasoning about this bloodline, and as this line can be traced through the houses of Orange and Stuart, we have to acknowledge that the bloodline of Jesus passes through both these houses. It would be ironic then, indeed, if the Irish Catholic hierarchy were demonising an organisation, i.e. the Orange Order, whose champion carried the Saint Graal, Holy Blood of Jesus, in his veins. This would also be mirrored on the Ulster Protestant side. Fundamentalists would never accept that James was descended from the same line as Jesus, or, more rationally, that the Orange Order is the preceptacle of the Jacobite teachings. This whole line of inquiry would imply that the Battle of the Boyne would have been a conflict between two branches of Jesus' family, a theory that Ralph Ellis, amongst others, favours when referring to this family's dispute. Why should these two dynasties, Orange and Stuart, be in dispute if they were both of the bloodline? The answers came through the researchers of Clive Prince and Lynn Picknett in the Templar Revelations. They maintained that there was a long and bitter dispute between Jesus and John the Baptist, resulting in the death of John. The findings of Lynn and Clive are worth further reading, for they possibly explain the roots of this Habsburg Bourbon dispute from a more ancient perspective. The latest scientific research tells us that the genetic code bloodline is passed through the female. Indeed, recently, in 2002, some geneticists claimed that the whole of humankind descended from just seven females, begging the question, where did the seven females come from and how were they impregnated? However, this would reinforce the assertion that William, as a descendant of the female line of the Stuarts, is as much of blood Stuart as James. J.P. Kenyon concludes that William was most definitely a pure blood Stuart, which supports my theory that it is the houses and not the bloodlines that are the key to a proper understanding of the parasitical system that holds our minds captive and drains our life. Bloodlines are, of course, important to the people who benefit and manipulate them for their own ends, as seen in the so-called royal and elite houses of Windsor, Stuart, Orange and the more pragmatic House of Rothschild. This also includes authors who propagate this theory. Having said that, if we accept that the geneticists say about man's origin, then we are all of the so-called bloodline. It seems that genetics, bloodlines, used in this specious manner is what astrology was to the pseudo-mystics of the Middle Ages. Astrology even eventually faded in the scientific light of astronomy, and genetics will find its proper scientific niche and rectifying abnormal genetic traits that cause ser ser serious diseases and possibly cure death itself. Yet old habits die hard. It was not until relatively recent times that it was grudgingly accepted, acceptable for royalty or other elite family members to marry outsiders. One of the underlying reasons for this possibility that it is easier to demand loyalty from and educate offspring about the workings of the system and how to profit from it. It also surrounds the families with an aura of mysticism. They would have us believe it is something in their blood that is special because it keeps us from looking so closely at the importance of the system of their houses. The bloodline is a manipulative tool. Nevertheless, this, this does not rule out physical genetic traits being passed on within families, although this does not make royal any one particular family. 
It has already been demonstrated how easy it is to infuse the bloodline into a house, as happened with the short-lived marriage of Diana and Charles. There is little doubt that the prince's marriage to Diana Spencer was an arranged one, and it was his grandmother who arranged it. We have already seen that there was no purer Stuart bloodline than that of William, but this did not stop powerful opposition to him in inheriting the British crown. Most of the aristocracy, represented by the immortal Seven, who inv invited him to England, wanted Mary of the House of Stuart to rule with William as her consort, but Mary insisted he rule jointly with her, so much for inherited bloodlines. Overcoming this barrier to his enthronement gives us one of the more mundane reasons William had to become a Horace king, a follower of Horace, to be initiated into something that su superseded the rules of the system. When this was accomplished, he could then, and only then, rule jointly with his wife, the de jure inheritor of the British throne, as an equivalent Stuart king. The histories of the houses of Orange and Stuart are littered with the mysteries that have yet to be unravelled. It has been well said, for instance, that arguments of support for Stuart tyranny should be close, closely re-examined as few merits for it are found in the historical record. We began our inquiries in this chapter by entering the ancient land of Bruna Boyne, and as Huxley counselled, we have followed humbly wherever nature led to gather the pieces of the puzzle strewn hither and thither that connect the ritual battle to the landscape and the ancient monuments. We discovered it is impossible to develop, delve into the history of one without referring to the other because of the inseparable link between each other. We now moved, we now moved the short distance from Brunaboyn to explore the little we know of the magical land of Emin and delve into some of its mysteries. To discover the roots of the relationship between the famous ritual battle and Bruna Boyne, Emin, we have to go back 5,000 years to the time when Newgrange, Nouth and Douth were in full bloom, operating as a universe, university campus and observatory. Slan le Eman, grief of darkness none, nor death, ill, nor any harm it hath. This tells of Emin's glory, or else such wondrous story. Newgrange, built several hundred years before the pyramids of Egypt, looks southeast over Emin, which of course it has to do to receive the rising sun. It also dominates the old route from Ulster to Emin. This is how this is how our guide on this part of our journey, the late Joe Downey, introduces us to the phenomenal Emin, secluded within the rolling landscape of Bruna Boyne. While Joe's tales about Emin stimulated my interest in these amazing surroundings, it st startled me to realise just how badly informed we are about the historical and esoteric significance of our own country. Joe, enigmatic historian, was one of the few, if not the only person, who had the key to the hidden kingdom of Emin. To guide us around, is it Ewan or Emin, Ewan, and explain its importance, you'll be left in his capable hands as he demonstrates his knowledge with the following example, which is extracted from his fascinating little booklet, 1987 Summer Guide to Innes Na, Na Rai, to give his insights justice. This article is reproduced in full. Make of it what you will. In the middle of the 12th century, Ewan disappears, and all place names connected with it are wiped out, and the central legendary is no more. The cover-up in regard to the names, such as Brudna Boyne, is often blamed on the Anglo-Normans. In a country of verbal tradition, it is something the Normans could not have done. There is a distinct impression that it was taken out through a combined conspiracy of Gaelic poets, Brehan judges and Irish monks. Local kings had become as greedy as the new arrivals and there is quite a lot to suggest that while they were both at each other's throats, the country's sages were quietly dismantling the supreme prize and making Ewan, Ewan disappear. Like the great stone cross on the fair green, it's slain. 
which some time before had taken up into the air and shattered, its shreds and fragments fallen over Telt, Temwar and Finnebar. Ewan too is taken up and distributed between Tara, Ewan, Maka, ancient capital of Ulster and headquarters of the Red Branch Knights, and the Cooley Peninsula. The triple fallout is reminiscent of the booster rockets of the ICBM and one would not be too surprised if the actual launching took place at Trechkrich, a few hundred yards from today's computer centre. The main payload was sent searing out into the northwestern sky, and having crossed the Arctic, they brought it down between Tibet and Outer Mongolia territory, which was not unknown to them. The lapis lazuli that went into their illuminated manuscripts was brought 7,000 miles from the heart of Central Asia, where the superpowers threatened their beloved Imwan were still to the belief that the world was flat. The sting was being set up and the powers that be fell for it. As a legend of Shangri-La, Shambhala was born, the rivers of ink began to flow and a mighty expedition was sent off with missionaries and gifts to the great king of Shambhala. If the Himalayas did not take care of them, Tibet certainly did, for none of them ever returned. Down the centuries, one European power followed another and few survived, and none that ever found it. In 1928, the Russian artist Nikola, Nicholas Rorich, better known for his collaborations with Stravinsky in the Rites of Spring, made it to the appointed place and gained the confidence of a high-ranking lama. The old man told him that Chang, North Shambhala, was beyond the great ocean. Within a decade, the Nazis, guided by the philosopher Haushofer, are on the same trail. Haushofer had done his homework and it is a double place. He calls it by its full name, Shambhala Agarthi. Agarthi he describes as a place of retirement and meditation, peoples by sages. Shambhala as a place of violence and power, whose forces command the elements and the masses of humanity and hasten the arrival of the human race at the turning point of time. If one drops the sham from Shambhala Agarthi, together with the counterbalancing syllable at the end. The resultant is Bala Garth. It is the Irish for Bali Garth, town within Innes Narai. With Iwan gone, some remained behind to seal the ancient entrances. The other returned to the, their homes and monasteries. Three monks sat down to write. One revised the Brendan voyage. Another, the man on the Irish five-pound note, packed a quarter of a million words into one of the greatest philosophical works of all time. He virtually called it after the Braden. It is the division of nature. The third sat down and wrote the Book of Linster. Most of it is a story about Ulster, the most comprehensive version of the Tain Bo Calain, or the cattle raid of Cooley. He writes it in Irish, in the last two lines, a blessing on everyone who will memorise the Tain faithfully in this form, and not put any other form on it. He then throws in a few lines in Latin to the effect that the book is a pack of devilish lies and suitable only for the enjoyment of idiots. It helps him pass the power. Censor. Back, however, in the main story, he inserts the single Latin word logo to complete his description of the gardens of Lu. He calls them Lagloctta, logo. Logo literally means word logos in ancient Greek for, and sooner or later, some wise publican will hang Lagloctta logo over his door, projecting the imagery of a place where one can get locked to the sound of words. But logo has two meanings. It is a twin, and the second meaning is a joke. It leaves one with the feeling that a lot of learned men went to their graves, their soft sadness balanced by a wicked sense of humour, down in the little graveyard of Rusad, near the village of Street and Co, West Meath. They had buried a man in the year 740. It was said that no woman could ever look at his grave without uttering an involuntary shriek or loud foolish laugh. Ewan the land of white water is often referred to 
as the very gentle land, now as then, it defies description and remains the preserve of the artist and of the poet. Above all, our thanks to all of our readers who have then chosen to dwell a while in our mists or has tarried for some time through the reflections of these pages. Health and long live life to you, the woman of your choice to you, land with rent to you, Agus, Bass and Erin. Joe passed on without being properly rewarded with the recognition he and his work so richly deserves. As far as known, at this time his research was lost, which, if true, is tragic because Joe possessed information about Iwan and the Brunaboyne megaliths that only comes with many years of diligent research and extraordinary intuition. It would have been great value to our story if there had been more time to listen and learn from him. Sadly, that was not to be. There is, however, a memory of one conversation we had when we explained to me that his theories about the spiral markings on one of the curbstones at New Grange. He showed me an aerial picture of exactly the same markings. These markings can only be seen from the air on the Iwan landscape, just as was depicted on the curbstone. Joe offered a possible explanation for this. From memory, he said, the people who lived in Iwan were sensitive to and somehow made use of the Earth's energies, possibly for healing. They would venture out to find sources, vortexes of energy, and then return to make a permanent record by making drawings on the stones to show where these energies lay. In much the same way a honeybee imparts its information by doing a spiral dance to let the rest of the hive know where it has found pollen. While we are on the subject, there is much speculation about the triple spiral markings that are found on the massive entrance stone and the interior of Newgrange. These are different to the markings Joe talks about. A particularly intriguing explanation comes from one of the Newgrange guides. This theory states that the sages of Newgrange would sit in meditation and stare intently at the spirals and would gradually drift into an altered state of consciousness. Another comes from Lomas and Knight that ties in with our story and will be referred to presently. At this point we will take our leave of Joe for the time being to retrace our steps and delve deeper into this amazing landscape. There was one last bend before we suddenly came upon what is officially known as one of the finest examples of a passage grave in Western Europe. As we nego negotiated the bend, ne the Newgrange Mound came suddenly into view. My heart missed a beat and only one word came to mind, cathedral. How could anyone believe that this magnificent structure was a burial place? Although fewer people came to people today accept this description, including mainstream thought, Newgrange was never merely meant for burials or to be seen simply as a tomb. It was seen as a cenotaph, temple, and declaration for all the ingenuity, power, and skills of its builders and a monument for future generations, so they would never be forgotten. To me, it could not be anything other than a place of work and work worship. Some researchers speculate that Bruna Boyne is a Gaelic name that applies to the Newgrange tumulus only, but Geraldine Stout, great name for an Irish woman, informs us that Bruna Boyne is also a geographic name. Today this area is known as the Bend of the Boyne, in former times, it was called Brun na Boyne. A bra in ancient Irish tales is translated as a mansion or a palace. As a place name in the Boyne Valley, bra probably has a topograph topographical identity long before it was first mentioned in 10th century poem by Sinead Ua Hertekain, D975. Even a superficial exploration of Newgrange would convince most of that it was never created to be a cemetery. Less enlightened souls may have used it for this purpose at a later time. Where better, then, for an ancient ritual to take place, to honour and demonstrate symbolically the advanced knowledge and civilization the ancients who resided here possessed? Newgrange is the most famous of all Irish prehistoric monuments, carbon dated to 3200 BCE, and predating the Great Pyramids of Giza by 500 years, it was rediscovered accidentally in 1699 
a full nine years after the Wolyamite army arrived in the region. By coincidence, the Templars excavated for nine years under Solomon's temple looking for the lost treasure, which gives us an excuse, if one were needed, to have another look at the unusual aspect of the Templar story. Raymond Bernard, Amorc's erstwhile supreme legate for Europe, reveals the importance of the numerals 9 and 11 and their connection with the Templars in this intriguing booklet, A Secret Meeting in Rome. He records in metaphorical language his conversations with the master of the temple about the establishing of the order in Jerusalem and its withdrawal from the public phase of its mission. Right, people, I'm going to end it there, and I'll see you in the second part of this third chapter called Bru Naboin. Thanks for listening.